the National Ignition Facility, which is part of the uh, Living Labs in California. Um, the scientists there announced that they had conducted an experiment where they used an array of laser beams uh, to shoot at a, a capsule of hydrogen, uh, and they produced a fusion reaction um, that resulted in, uh, I think it was 10 quadrillion watts of energy. Um, that was about 70% of the en energy um, input that they used for the experiment. So I, obviously the goal is to produce more energy uh, than, than you put in. That, that's, that's, that's the point of this. Uh, but 70% it is was, it was a very big deal. Uh, it, you know, it, it's much bigger than had ever been achieved before uh, at the facility. Um, and it, it's well on the way to what, what we call breakthrough, which is where you're, you're getting more energy out than, than you put in. Um, so th this is still a, a very, very long way from um, a viable energy source of any kind. But that said, uh, it is real progress. And combined with a couple of other sort of tantalizing uh, signs of progress el elsewhere in the, in the field of fusion, um, I think it's cause for a reasonable amount of optimism uh, about this technology, uh, certainly in, in the medium, you know, in the, in, over the next few decades. Uh, I think it, 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 there's more reason for optimism now than it has been, I think. Um, in, in our in our recent editorial um, on this, we referred to this as the chemistry of this, this uh, harnessing the chemistry of the stars. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, what that means precisely? Uh, right. So, so, so like I said, you, you're fusing um, these atoms together. That, that creates um, a lot of energy. Um, in theory, th this would be uh, more or less limitless uh, energy if you could ever harness a fusion in a, in a reactor. Um, it's also, uh, it, it will be inherently safe. Um, there's no there's no risk of meltdown uh, in a fusion reactor. Uh, it requires a constant power source, and if that source is interrupted, the reaction simply stops. Um, it produces no low, it doesn't produce any um, long-term hazardous waste like fission does. Um, the waste it does produce is quite limited and, and, and manageable. Um, and it produces no greenhouse gases. Um, so you, you can see why this would be a power source that, uh, you know, it's often referred to as a holy grail. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, there are, there are a lot of reasons for optimism now that I think we're, we're not there in the past. Um, and if you could harness this technology uh, feasibly, you'd have a very long term, very clean, very powerful source of energy that, that would be really be a breakthrough for, for, for humankind. Um, you, you said that there's a that there's an old joke out there that um, nuclear, you know, nuclear fusion is just 20 years away and it always will be. Um, realistically, realistically speaking, um, uh, based on the breakthrough we made last month, um, how far how far are we away you know from from this uh, you know from this uh, energy utopia uh well like i said you, you know realistically you're, you're talking about a time frame of decades um but uh, there, there is a lot of progress i think you have uh, for one thing there are a lot of private companies uh now in, investing in technology i think there are about two dozen uh companies in the u.s that have fusion projects underway um our colleague uh, Chris Kadamsky, Kadamsky at uh, Bloomberg NEF, I think he estimated that about 300 million was uh, invested in the field last year. So th that's a big deal. Um, all these companies are working on uh, different techniques for, for achieving fusion. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on. I, I think that that's, uh, that's progress. Um, an, a, another reason for optimism is that um, advances in a lot of other technologies um, are probably going to make fusion easier to achieve. So uh, artificial intelligence, um, Supercomputing, uh, computer modeling, uh, material science, um, 3D printing, you know, all, all of these technologies that are leading to advances in other industries, I think also may have applications of fusion that, that will help speed this along, maybe make it cheaper, uh, faster, more cheaper. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I take the point that it's always 20 years away. I think that there's always reason for, for skepticism when you're talking about nuclear fusion. Like I said, everybody pulls the whole grill. But that said, there is real progress. Uh, these companies are breaking ground on demonstration facilities. Um, it's becoming real in a way it hasn't in, in, in a long time. Uh, so I, I think um, it, it's something that when you, when you talk about time frame, I, like I said, realistically, um, some of these companies are saying 10, 15 years, they're, they're going to have a viable energy course. I think that might be excessively optimistic. But to imagine that um, fusion might be part of the green energy mix by, say, 2050, I, I don't think it's completely uh, outmanned. Uh, so uh, nuclear fusion has um, attracted some of the some of the big names in the in the, in the tech world. Um, Bill Gates um, uh, has a as an enterprise up. Uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, when he's not flying off into space, uh, is also is 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 also work is also working. So um, it, it, 
is 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 this a new you know billionaire boys club uh, van, van, you know vanity project or is it, is this kind of um, private sector competition you know you know part of the mix that um, may um, you know get us the, get us there faster? Right. Yeah. I, I guess I've never really understood this this objection. Uh, it, you know, if, if billionaires want to spend money, uh, you know. Uh, addressing extraordinarily difficult public policy challenges, then I, th I think great. We should want more of them to do that. Uh, I, I have no. If Richard Branson wants to spend a zillion dollars making it cheaper and easier to get into space, that's great. It's going to have uh, beneficial applications for global humankind. Uh, and so, if if Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos want to invest a whole lot of money uh, in, in a new shot on nuclear fusion, well, you know, it, it may not work. But if it does, it, it would have immense benefits for for all society. So I think the more billionaires who jump in, into this, uh, the better. Uh, I, I have I have no problem with that. Uh, that said, you know, unfortunately, if we're talking about climate change, um, you know, this this is a challenge that can't be solved simply by enterprise billionaires. Um, you know, you're, you're going to need real policy changes in the meantime. Even on very optimistic time frames, we're talking about decades before this work with technology. It, those are decades, unfortunately, that are really critical in getting a handle on climate change. Uh, and so you need uh, you know you need policy changes before that. You need uh, public support for those changes. Um, so, so I, I fully applaud uh, these billionaires. I think it's great that they're getting involved, uh, but unfortunately, I, I don't think that's going to be sufficient to to, to, the, to the scale of the problems that we're. Uh, you mean my, you mean my fantasy of uh, of, a, of a nuclear fusion powered uh, Tesla rocket powered by Elon Musk, you know, heading heading into space is is not gonna is not gonna be happening anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, that would be awesome. I would I would I would hop on one of those uh, uh, tomorrow. But no, I, I think realistically uh, that that's not in the cards. Um, I, I think you know the, the goal that uh, President Biden has set, for instance, of net zero carbon emissions by twenty fifty. You know, if you have uh, a much expanded role for nuclear, both, both traditional and fusion, um, I think that goal becomes much more feasible. Um, it's it's not feasible on current trends. We're not going to get there um, with, with the, the energy mix we have right now. Um, if you have an energy mix that includes fusion by 2050, uh, it starts to look a lot more plausible, I think. Uh, and so, that, you know, we're not going to have fusion powered rockets tomorrow, but I, I do think that, you know, there are an awful lot of signs for progress and reasons for, for optimism. Um, that's that, that, that's a great that's a great segue into the the, the next segment. Uh, you you're talking about you know the the, the policy aspect uh, in terms of nuclear f fusion being part of uh, the green of the green energy mix. Um, what are the what are the regulatory concerns and what should the reg what should what should uh, politicians regulators be thinking about in terms of uh, e either helping to encourage um, uh, nuclear fusion or, you know, to, you know, restrain it if, if there's any reason to. Uh, right. So I, I would say three things. One, um, I think it's important to emphasize that fusion is not going to be a magical solution to climate change. Uh, sort of, uh, like I said before, to, to, reiter to reiterate, you're going to need policy changes, um, both on the supply and demand side. You're going to need investment in resilience and clean energy. You're going to need a carbon tax, in my view. It's totally essential. Um, so it, it's important to under, understand the limitations of this technology, at least in the, in the medium term. Um, two, in terms of regulation, um, the like I said, fusion is inherently much, much safer than fission. Um, we regulate fission very, very aggressively in this country, rightly so. It's quite dangerous. Um, the dangers posed by fusion are, are not remotely on the same scale. Um, and when you impose regulation that, that's as strict as we have on, on fission reactors, um, it, it makes it safer, obviously, but it, it raises costs, um, it causes immense delays, uh, and pointedly for, for fusion, it's going to impede investment in otherwise very promising companies. They're not, nobody's going to want to put money into a company that's going to have to spend decades dealing with red tape, uh, particularly when it's, it's not necessary uh, for a technology that's a So obviously there, there are limited risks, um, it, it's a trade-off, but I think regulators in this country need to be mindful that um, the benefits, the potential benefits to fusion are immense. Uh, and the risks are, relatively speaking, really quite small. So I, I think you, we need to keep that in mind. Um, the third thing I would say is, I, I think Congress could do a better job of encouraging this technology. Um, you know, uh, federal federal funding for basic research on fusion has been effectively flat for decades. Um, in, in real terms, it's, you know, it's declined. Um, I think it makes sense to me. The, the, we invest, invested a bit more in the spending bill at the end of the year. But, you know, I think a, a long-term federal commitment to fusion research, basic fusion research, I think, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, two, 
building these reactors is immensely costly. Um, like I said, you've got a lot of companies working on this thing. Thinking about public-private partnerships with those companies to build these reactors, I think would have a lot of public benefits. Uh, you don't need to fund boondoggles, but you know we have a number of examples. Uh, for instance, if you think about NASA's partnership with SpaceX, um, where you can make one of these PPPs work uh, in, in a way that can restrain costs and can lead to a lot of innovation. So I, I think those are the sorts of things co uh, Congress should be thinking about. Uh, I don't think fusion should be caused for uh, complacency uh, or pretending that climate change isn't happening. Um, I, I think we should put a lot of effort into it, uh, even if it's not going to be a magical solution. Um, but you know, there there are a lot of things that policymakers I think can be doing to to push this process along. Um, in, in our um, in, in our recent editorial, I think you 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 pointed out that um, one of the reasons why we've gotten to this point has been uh, the the advances in other areas um, other areas of, of technology um, such as uh, high um, uh, high speed um, high speed computing uh, uh, you know artif artificial intelligence three uh, D printing and, all, and 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 so and, and so forth. Um, is does does that you know does that suggest that uh, you know the, you know the private sector uh, is still you know an incredibly valuable important resource in getting us there even though as you said um, the, the uh, that there is clearly a role for public research and Congress giving funding that the uh, that there, there there really it really has to be two tracks uh, to to get us to this goal. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that that's quite useful. Um, you know, a lot of these technologies, of course, were developed in private sector. Um, one of the reasons this experiment at, at Livermore um, works so well is through improvements in computer modeling uh, and tinkering those models uh, more will probably lead to, to you know more breakthroughs. I think that that's quite important. Um, you know, are any of these companies going to be viable commercial uh, concerns within ten years? I, I, again, there's reason to be skeptical. But I think trying to harness the power of, of competition is quite important. Um, I think there are going to be tons of ancillary benefits to any any research that goes into this. This is an extraordinarily complicated engineering challenge, complicated scientific challenge. Uh, it, it's it's really not going to be easy to get there. From here. Um, but I applaud these companies for trying. I, I applaud investors for trying to take a risk on a moonshot that could have immense uh, public benefits. Um, and and I think you know that uh, in conjunction with. Um, uh, an enhanced uh, public role with uh, policy changes, with climate change in mind. I think, uh, you know, eventually you're going, you, you really feasibly could have a technology that has immense long-term benefits uh, for humanity. Uh, and that could lead to a lot of, a lot of really uh, beneficial breakthroughs. Oh, uh, as we, um, um, as, as we draw, as we draw to a close, um, you know, what are, um, you know, what are the possible potholes um, on the, you know, on the road to a, uh, to a nuclear fusion future? Uh, either, either on the, either on the policy side, on the regulatory side. You know what, what, are, what are some of the things we should be worried about? Yeah, I mean the road, the road is filled with, <laughs> the road ahead is filled with bottles. Uh, I, you know, that's okay. Uh, many scientific challenges are like this, uh, but you know, like I said, there are immense engineering challenges to be solved. Um, there are, you know, even very basic questions about how to construct experiments and so on are really up in the air. Uh, but that said, you know, the, the more researchers are working on this, the more companies are competing to make a viable uh, commercial energy source, uh, you know, those problems, I, I, th I think there's reason to hope that those problems will be solved. Uh, we're very good at, at solving problems in this country with technology. Uh, and I think uh, my hope uh, is that you, um, nuclear fusion will be, will be no exception to that. Well, well, that sounds that sounds like a perfect place to stop. Um, once again, once again, um, my colleague Tim Lavin, thanks for um, thanks for joining us, and uh, thank you um, for watching. And uh, please join us next time um, for 